Welcome to the Cold Case Christianity Broadcast, the only Christian case-making program hosted by a cold case homicide detective. J. Warner Wallace has been investigating cold case murders in Los Angeles County for over a decade. His work has been featured on Fox News, Court TV, and Dateline. For more information about Jim's work and the case for Christianity, please visit coldcasechristianity.com. Now, here's your host, J. Warner Wallace. Thanks for joining us at Cold Case Christianity. I'm Jay Warner Wallace. Uh, I get asked this question a lot. What do you do if you're working cold cases, you're working homicides, and, and how do you reconcile the problem of evil? You see it all the time when you're working homicide suspects. And um, sometimes you find yourself uh, asking the question, you know, it's not. It's hard not to get cynical and skeptical about people when you're always working the worst uh, aspect of our human nature. You're always examining the worst aspect of our nature. And so the problem of evil is often a question that I get asked by uh, both uh, victims, uh, by observers who are watching trials. We happen to be in the middle of a trial right now, and, and we'll get a verdict here pretty soon. And, and you, you watch the entire length of the trial, and you can't help but uh, find yourself asking questions about the nature of evil. Why? How could an all-powerful, all-loving God allow some of the horrific things we see happen in these cases to occur to begin with? And, and you know, you find yourself, when you're working these cases, really... You, you have to kind of ask yourself why you're working these cases and what, of course, you think, well, of course, you're working homicides. You're trying to do the right thing. That's all true. Uh, but sometimes what you're asking is, is, you know, who are you really working for here? I mean, you're really working for families that have for 30 years uh, wondered what really happened uh, to their daughter, to their son, to their husband, or had a sense of they knew what happened, but uh, were frustrated by the fact that justice was never served in this case. And and you always hear this kind of language, oh, um, you know, if you work these cases and you solve these cases and somebody gets convicted of these, uh, one of these horrific murders, that eventually families will have closure. Well, I'm here to tell you that victims never, victims' families never have closure. Uh, you might find justice if if you uh, work hard and you're uh, able to convince a jury. You'll 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 might have justice will be served, but but you're never going to feel that closure. The, the, when you lose somebody this way, um, you're always going to have open questions, um, a, a pain that that is never reconciled. And and I think it's natural for those of us who have seen this kind of thing or maybe experienced this kind of loss ourselves to have questions about the nature of evil. How could an all loving, all powerful God allow this kind of uh, moral evil in the world. And you have to kind of reconcile it one of three ways. Either one, he's not all-powerful enough to stop it. Or, or two, he's not loving enough to care enough to stop it, even though he could. Or the third one, which is the uh, position I held for many, many years, which was simply that God doesn't exist at all, which is why you happen to see so much evil in the world. So I, I want to talk today a little bit about the problem of addressing the problem of evil, because I think it is a challenge for those of us who have to do it, or find ourselves wanting to address it, or find ourselves struggling with this issue in our own lives, or this question in our own lives, especially if we have uh, suffered uh, evil, uh, like uh, the kinds of cases that I work all the time. This next case is a Dateline case. You'll see it on Dateline soon enough. And, and as you see it, you'll, you'll feel the pain that this family felt. I think all these cases that I've posted on Dateline uh, have been similar in that sense, that these families have really struggled with the pain. And not all of them have been believers. A few have. A few of these families have really had to struggle with the problem of evil in the context of a Christian worldview. So we'll talk about that today, and I want to share with you just my kind of thoughts about the problem of evil. Yes, I will default to the uh, issue of uh, human freedom uh, as an explanation for moral evil, but at the same time, I think that the the, the answering the problem of evil is much is much uh, broader than that, much more involved than that, and that is in fact the problem with the problem of evil. It's that it's not a quick answer. Even if you are, uh, have a very focused, narrow question you're t trying to answer, and you think, well, I can actually answer that narrow uh, question in a narrow way, but honestly, it's not going to be, probably not going to be uh, very satisfying to those who are experiencing evil themselves. As a matter of fact, I think we often want to rush to an academic, rather academic explanation or an academic answer for what in many times is a, is a deeply hurtful emotional uh, uh, problem. Of emotional pain that is felt. I mean, we sometimes rush with an answer when we really should rush with a hug or rush with just patient listening or just an understanding, empathetic ear. 
And instead, uh, if you're someone like me who fashions themselves as a case maker, as a Christian case maker, you're instead trying to resolve, answer a question, fix a problem, when that often is not what's being uh, required of you anyway, or what's being asked of you. I can tell you there have been many times when um, dealing with fam families who are hurting in this way, that I might spend a half an hour trying to make a case for something when my wife Susie can simply walk up and show the kind of empathy necessary that I'm not sometimes able to show because I'm always thinking about the answers rather than simply ex uh, moving through the experience with people who are suffering this kind of evil. I mean, if you think about it, from the Christian worldview, all of us, it, it, Christianity probably has the best opportunity to respond to this because Christianity is the one worldview in which our God, our Savior, experienced this kind of evil in a first-hand way and turned this experience, this, this act of obedient submission to something horrifically evil into something uh, very beautiful. And so this idea of, of how we might reconcile this from a Christian worldview, we should have some, some chops in some way. Don't you think? We should have some uh, special insight given what Jesus suffered for us. So uh, I think we're going to take some time today. First of all, in this first segment, let me just give you in a few seconds here why I think that the issue of moral evil is perhaps one of the, for me at least, it never caused me to stumble as a new Christian. Even as an atheist, I, I reconciled the problem of evil. If there was a God, this seemed reasonable to me. If there is a God who is a good, quote-unquote, good God, well, the, this God has a couple of choices here. He could create a world in which there is no love at all. Or he could create a world in which love is possible. If you just look at it from that narrow perspective, a world in which love exists or a world in which love could never exist, we both would agree that a good God, by definition, would be the kind of God who would, it would actually create a world in which love is possible. Of course, the problem is that that is a very dangerous, scary world. Because love cannot be coerced. You can't say to your kids tomorrow, if you're having rebellious kids, you can't say, you will love me. You can force them to obey you. You can even force them to show the outward signs of respect towards you. But the idea that you could force them to love you is really, it's, it's a fiction. They have to, they, your kids have to have the freedom to be able to uh, freely choose to love you. Then, when that happens, love, of course, is genuine. It's not coerced. It's not just a rote action. It actually comes from the heart. Of course, that kind of freedom requires you also, if you are the God of the universe creating this kind of world, you'd have to allow people the freedom to not love. That's what this freedom actually entails. The freedom to do otherwise. And this is what, of course, is so dangerous about a world in which love is possible. It's also a world in which hate is possible. Now, I want you just to think about it for a second, though. I think you could have an argument against God's nature or against the evil nature of God. If you said that God would create a world that's this dangerous, that allows for this kind of personal freedom, and then would never give you the appropriate guidelines to help you um, avoid the pitfalls, avoid the kind of evil, avoid the kind of behavior that could be construed as evil, I think that would be uh, irresponsible of God. And you might say that that kind of God would actually be evil. Somebody who would give you a knife but not tell you which side to grab it from. But that's not the kind of God that we worship as Christians. We worship a God who's given us the freedom to do evil or to do something beautiful, to love deeply in a way that's actually genuine and not coerced. And then he's given us the guidelines so that we would not, we, we, we can avoid doing those things that are hurtful. It's not as though he hasn't given us guidelines. He's given us a set of rails to keep us safe. We sometimes, of course, choose to reject the rails, reject the guidelines, and we get into all kinds of problems by doing that. But it's not as though God did not give us the freedom to do what's right and the direction and guidance to guide us in this direction. We simply, in our rebellion, often choose to do otherwise. Now that, I think, in some ways is an appropriate response, but I don't always think it's very satisfying. And I'll talk about that after the break, and then we'll talk about the larger problem of answering the problem of evil. How did they miss this? A Huntington Beach man is behind bars tonight, accused of a murder more than 30 years ago. We're looking for the thing that's really hiding in plain sight. Which of these things in this crime scene doesn't fit this scene? For me, this is a calling. Yeah, I'm clearly an evidentialist. That's just my perspective as a skeptic. Uh, that was what I valued, making cases, making criminal cases. So it shouldn't surprise anybody that when I began to examine 
Christianity, that's the approach I took. I, I think what we're seeing in the church is that the greater and greater need for case making. A man is arrested outside his home, accused of having a role in the 1981 disappearance of his wife. Carol vanished 30 years ago, leaving behind her two children, Mikey and Brandy. The family would have been more than happy to believe that Carol is still out there somewhere. If Carol was dead, if Mike killed her, Taking the accusation to court would be risky, but Prosecutor Lewin decided to roll the dice. On April 13, 2011, Mike was arrested for Carol's murder. I've learned enough, I think, to be able to help the church do what it needs to do, to understand how evidence is processed, to understand how we put the case together, to understand how powerful the circumstantial case is, but also what we believe about the foundational views we have as Christians in a culture that is becoming more and more non-Christian. Now is the time. This is the time when we need to get serious about how to present it to a culture which is challenging what we believe more and more every day. Okay, now I sometimes get asked to come and do talks on the problem of evil, and I, I, I've limited the kinds of talks I actually do these days. Uh, I used to do a broad range of talks. As a pastor, I think I designed talks, uh, maybe 60 or 70, that were full multimedia talks that I did over a course of years with youth groups in any broad number of, of areas. But since writing the book Cold Case Christianity, I've been asked to kind of stay in my lane. And I'm actually perfectly fine with that. Someday we'll do another uh, broadcast on why it's so important for each of us to stay in the lane that God has given us. And I think this is an area that I can speak to, and at least in some way, through practical experience as a cold case detective, this area of what, how we respond, uh, how we can even consider uh, the problem of evil. So I do a talk that's called the cold case problem of evil. Can you imagine why I would call it that? But yes, it's called that. That's the title of it. And what I try to do is answer um, the problem of evil, at least provide some thought-provoking questions that you might ask yourself or somebody else who's maybe struggling with this issue for themselves. And I think sometimes that's the best we can do. It's not that we always can provide locked down 100%, this is going to satisfy every question you've ever had related to the problem of evil. Instead, I think it's broader for us, wiser for us rather, to, to, to offer uh, more general questions that can start us to think about options that might be, might be satisfying as we kind of consider them in total, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, I think that for me, when I do this talk around the nation, uh, I, I really try to break the problem of evil down into several categories. Now, I'm going to show you some pieces from the, me the media that I use while, when doing this talk. And I call this talk Resident Evil. And, and I call it that because, of course, I'm usually working with younger folks. I'm, I'm actually more interested in the youngest generation in our church, youngest generations in our church than any other generations, if I can be honest with you. I think that these folks who are in high school and college age years, uh, college years, those are the folks who are really uh, facing the biggest challenges. And I think that we as case makers need to have these folks in our sites uh, to help them to, to process this, uh, these ideas, the, the objections they're going to encounter in college, all of that. And this is a culture in general, and media, and TV, and, and cable, whatever you're watching, the internet. Uh, I think it's important for us to be able to help them answer the objections. And so I look at the issue of evil, and I think you have to answer it in one of five large categories. One, moral evil. Two, the problem of natural evil, this idea that, uh, you know, what do you, how do you explain um, uh, earthquakes, tsunamis, those kinds of things. Three, bodily evil, the pain and suffering issue. Why should I be in pain? Why, you know, why should anyone suffer at all? Uh, four, what I call theistic evil. This is the kind of evil that sometimes people like Richard Dawkins will complain that, you know, uh, Christianity uh, in the Old Testament of, of Judaism, that God described in the Old Testament sure seems to be pretty horrifically... Um, uh, in, in some ways, of course, he's got a whole list, right, of, of the scriptures he uses for the horrific, um, uh, morally repugnant uh, God of the Old Testament. So I think we need to be able to address those, those, those questions, because people are going to have those as broad categories of the problem of evil. And the fifth one is what I call the problem of Christian evil, which are those... Um, claims or uh, accusations that uh, Christians themselves are the cause of much evil, or maybe of, uh, that some people would say of, of most evil through history. So you have to kind of uh, address those five categories. Moral evil, natural evil, pain and suffering, theistic evil, and Christian evil. Now that, I think, is what causes this to be a challenge to begin with. Is because almost all the time, any one question about the problem of evil is going to intersect and overlap, at least in some way, with other 
categories of evil that we sometimes don't even see the connection that is in people's minds. And we are will address only one aspect of this and ignore some of the other aspects of the problem of evil. So I, I think this, it's best, this is why I try to take time in an hour talk. I, how Can you imagine trying to answer five categories of evil in an hour? But again, if we're simply providing a series of questions that might start us thinking about how to answer the problem, I think that could be very helpful. And that's what I try to do in this talk. But anyway, I wanted to show you that today because I want to illustrate for you why I think this problem of evil is such a problem to answer. Here's why. Now, if you've ever seen uh, some of the talks that I've done related to the reliability of Scripture, one of the things I do in Cold Case Christianity is explain the power of cumulative circumstantial cases. Because people have given circumstantial evidence a bad name, but in reality, all my cases are made this way where you've got five, ten, fifty, a hundred small, seemingly insignificant pieces of evidence that point to the same conclusion, the guilt of a particular defendant in a particular case. And as you look at all of these, and I usually use an example from one case in which you, I provide seven or eight different uh, pieces of evidence that all point to the same suspect. And as I do that, people understand then the power of a cumulative circumstantial case. And I have to kind of explain to them the difference between circumstantial evidence is also called indirect evidence as opposed to direct evidence, which is the testimony of eyewitnesses. So indirect evidence, if I've got a cumulative indirect case, it will actually, I think, uh, be very clear at the end of this. And I've never had a jury take much time in coming to a conclusion about what the evidence um, infers given this kind of robust cumulative case. Now, the reason why I bring it up is because I think answering the problem of evil is much, uh, very similar at least, to doing this kind of cumulative case. Here's why. Consider for a second just the nature of the objection itself and how short it can be and how rhetorically powerful it can be. Uh, just to state it in the fewest possible words, I'll just read it. If God is all-powerful and all-loving, why is there so much evil in the world? Now, do you see how fast I was able to voice that objection? I was actually able to, to, to voice it in just a few minutes. And I was able to voice it uh, with just a, a few words. So a few seconds and a few words. That's how, and it's rhetorically powerful. I mean, it's a question that causes you to stop and go, yeah, you're right. Well, how could that be? Now, if we're going to answer, for, so for example, if you saw that kind of an objection in a post on a Facebook page or in some social media, Reddit or whatever, you know that's going to be a hard, you're not going to be able to answer that objection as quickly as the objection was offered. That's the problem with the problem of evil, is that in order to answer the question, you have to make a robust case. What, when we're talking about evil, what are we talking about? You've got to help people realize that there are uh, five different kinds of evil, all of which have overlapping significance for one another. And of course, we've got responses, ways of dealing with all five categories, but they're also uh, overlapping. And I might have one or two different ways I would respond to each problem of evil I've previously described for you. And so you see how all of these responses link together and have to be offered, I think, to, be, to completely satisfy in your own mind uh, the problem of evil. It's not as though I can satisfy the problem of evil or answer that objection in the same amount of time it took to voice it. I can't at all. Instead, I've actually got to take the time to, to make this very complete, robust, cumulative, circumstantial response. Wow, that's a lot of work. to Now, I want you to compare now as I go back. Take a look at the... Um, the uh, objection as it's first offered. If God is all-powerful and all-loving, why is there so much evil in the world? Pretty short. Rhetorically powerful. Now, I actually recently wrote a blog post in which I was trying to just respond and show the rich cumulative nature of the response, why the response needs to be so robust, right? So I wrote it out and I tried to keep it very brief, as, as brief as I possibly could, knowing that the objection itself is brief. But I want you to see, compared to the objection itself, look at how, how many words the response might, might take, even when you're keeping it incredibly brief. Do you see the problem here now? The, the, the objection can be offered in uh, a dozen words. The response takes hundreds of words. So I, I, I show this to you here uh, on this particular broadcast, just so you can uh, be aware of the fact that Probably the best place to talk about the problem of evil is not going to be in the context of 
oh, a blog post, uh, a, a stream of, of comments on a YouTube video or uh, on Twitter or on Facebook. It's probably going to be in the context of deep uh, relationships that you have over a long period of time with people who will allow you the time and the space to be able to respond with the kind of depth necessary to do the answer justice. That's the problem with the problem of evil. It's easy to posit the problem. It's not as easy to respond to the problem. And by the way, this is not because our response has to be uh, this act of desperation and creative exercise and, and massaging the truth. Murders take place in a second. Yet to make the case against a particular suspect, we might take months, years. It's hard to put things back when they're broken. It's hard to put things back together. So don't be surprised when the objection is short, but the response is a much more thoughtful, much more um, uh, uh, strenuous effort on your part. It's worth making the effort, but you're going to have to be careful about where and how you make that effort. Okay, take a quick break. When we come back, I want to show you why I think the problem of evil, if you really carefully consider it, is more a problem for those who aren't Christians than for those who are. In addition to Jim's daily blog and weekly podcasts and videos, Jim continues to write books designed to help you become a better Christian casemaker. At coldcasechristianity.com, you'll find a link to Cold Case Christianity, a homicide detective investigates the claims of the Gospels, and Alive, a cold case approach to the resurrection. These resources will help you defend what you believe and share it with others. Be sure to visit the Cold Case Christianity website daily to read Jim's blog, watch the weekly video, or listen to the Cold Case Christianity podcast. You'll also find great free resources, including the free downloadable monthly Bible insert. While you're there, be sure to sign up for Jim's daily case note email. Cold Case Christianity is designed to help you become a better Christian case maker. Okay, let me share with you now why I think the problem of evil is in some ways more of a problem for those who are not Christians than it is for those who are. And I'll do it using this ridiculous shoestring here, which I often use, I used to use in youth groups. And here's what I mean and why I use it. As an atheist, and I was an atheist for the first eight to ten years of my professional life as a law enforcement officer, and I saw a lot of horrific stuff. But during those years, I was con convinced that life was just like this line segment. A line segment is a line between two points. Uh, these two knots I've actually tied, if you can barely see them, in the uh, string. Now, these two lines uh, basically represent birth and death, and the line the distance in between the two is simply um, your life. Now, if something was to happen to you, I expected, by the way, this line segment to be about 90 years. And my family's got pretty good longevity, and I always figured, but well, I, I think my, I could make 90. My grandparents all made 90. Some of them made past 90. So if I would have gotten sick or something bad would have happened to me, say halfway through that, say at 45, I would have been, I would have felt like it wasn't fair because I expect to get 90. And so you see a lot of what, how I perceive evil and what happens to me in my life was based on my perception of life to begin with as being a line segment between two points. Now, on the other hand, if life is not really like that at all, but instead it is a, uh, a ray that starts with a point called birth and extends on into eternity, because you're more than just a body, you're a living soul. If this is the nature of life, if it's really about a, a ray that extends out into eternity, that gives you a very different perspective on suffering, on evil, on anything bad that might happen to you in your life. If you've only got 90 years and something bad happens to you in the first five, you could have a reason to be complaining about it, couldn't you? But on the other hand, if your life is eternal and stretches out into eternity, okay if that is really your life well that's very different and then what you might experience in the first five years of your life when compared to eternity remember as this line moves in this direction any period of suffering in your life if it's 10 years it becomes smaller and smaller relative to eternity as that line stretches out the amount of suffering you seem to experience I don't care how grave it is look for those of you, for example, who were, uh, remember your youth, maybe you were uh, sick as a child or you um, hurt yourself as a child, how about this? 
a lot of us as as boys, we were circumcised as, as as infants. Do you think that was fun? Yet by the time you're two or three years old, heck, by the time you're a year old, you have no memory of that incredible day, a point of suffering, because you're now a year away from it. You're, it's, it occupies just a, a few moments in your life relative to the year you've now lived. And of course, by the time you're 10 years old, it, you, you have to be explained what happened to you because you have no memory of it at all. Why? Because that point of suffering relative to the nature of your life as a 10-year-old seems very much like a moment in time, a whisper, a quick, brief instant relative to the length of your 10-year-old life. Now imagine if we are truly eternal beings who will live without a body that suffers, without pain and suffering, without the evil we experience in this world, we will live in eternity with God. Then imagine then the proportional relationship between any suffering you might experience in this life and the eternity you will live with God. That proportion relative to one another turns that suffering into a brief instant and you'll see that Peter even describes this brief moment of suffering we experience in life. And of course, he was talking to people who had suffered for years. But why would you call it brief? Because again, he's got an eternal perspective in which he's looking at all of life as the eternity of life. And relative to the time you spend on earth, eternity is quite long. So I think that the problem of evil is far more dramatic for those who are non-believers who believe that life is this line segment between two dots than it is for those of us who are Christians who believe that life is in fact uh, eternal and starts over here with a point in time but then goes off into eternity with your life with God. If that is the nature of life, I think we need to reconsider uh, what we really think is evil and how and how we uh, how we really assess evil in our lives, pain and suffering in our lives and are we better able to endure it? If you knew the amount of suffering you were going to have to endure would be brief. You can, you can muscle through it. If you believe your life is eternal, then whatever suffering you're going to experience here in this earth, I know it's, it's, it's impossible to say it as a guy who's healthy, who's not suffering, but you've got to at least admit from a kind of uh, investigative, rational perspective, if we are eternal beings, whatever suffering we're going to experience in this life, by comparison, will be brief. So I hope that kind of helps you to think through the issue, the problem with the problem of evil. I think, number one, it's a robust cumulative case you've got to make, uh, even when talking about uh, issues related to moral, natural, theistic, Christian, pain and suffering, all those different kinds of evil. And two, it's oftentimes hard to talk to non-believers about this because we have a different foundational perspective on what the nature of life is to begin with. So start talking about those issues and I think you'll make some progress. Until next week, I'll see you right back here at Cold Case Christianity. Thanks for joining us at the Cold Case Christianity broadcast. If you're interested in more information about this week's topic, please visit coldcasechristianity.com. For a thorough investigation of the reliability of the New Testament Gospels in the case for Christianity, be sure to purchase Cold Case Christianity, a homicide detective investigates the claims of the Gospels. It's available wherever books are sold.